Hey, this is Brent Jensen. You're listening to No Sleep Till Sudbury, the show where we talk about the music that makes your skin vibrate. And today, it is my pleasure to welcome back to the show, all the way from the UK, British magazine editor and author of more than 30 books, Mr. Joel McIver. Joel, how are you, sir? Uh, All the better for being back on your amazing show, Brent. Thank you very much for having me back. (laughs) Thank you. It's always a pleasure to have you. I love it. It's great to catch up with you. It's, it's been a little while since you've been on last, so I'm happy that you're here. It's been a few years and the world has completely changed. Really oh, radically in that. No kidding. Bizarre, bizarre times. But we're still here, still listening to the heavy music. That's right. That's the good news. There are positives. I haven't grown up and got a life yet. No, there's plenty of time for that later. That can wait. We need to talk about heavy metal today. All right, let's do that. So in addition to your books, you write, as, as my listeners know, for you know people like Glenn Hughes from Deep Purple. You co-write autobiographies, uh, Megadeth's Dave Ellefson. You also write regularly for rock magazines like Classic Rock and Metal Hammer. Uh, you're the editor of Bass Guitar Magazine. But I was reading a yeah. post on your social media this week that 10 years ago in Poland, you were at the first ever show to include every band in the thrash metal group known as the big four Metallica Slayer, Anthrax and Megadeth. You were there at the very first show you were sent there by metal hammer to cover it. What was that like, Joel? You know, just hearing you describe it that way, Brent, you know, sends chills down my spine. A bit. It was, um, it was incredible. It was, I mean, I had that the post to which you're referring is written in this, very sort of over the top fanboy style for good reason because i it, it wasn't just going to another show mm-hmm. for those who are listening to this this podcast they probably already know that this big four thrash event was metallica slayer megadeth and anthrax and these four bands had not toured together before and they are the biggest in commercial terms bands of that genre of music so when uh, metallica came up with the idea of doing a few dates of that lineup it was just huge in in the heavy metal community it was massive and uh, that, I think I don't know how many of these shows were. There, there were probably about ten of them or something. Mm-hmm. The last of all were in America and were huge and were regular big festivals. Now the one I went to <laughs> was like was like the kind of starter version, right? Yeah. So they had announced a sort of a, a relatively low key series of shows as part of the Sonosphere Festival in 2010 um, in Eastern Europe, right? That's where they started, mm-hmm. and um, which I, guess is, I don't know if that's unusual or not. I mean, it made sense because I guess they needed to gauge interest but this particular one took place uh, at an old airport outside warsaw which had all the um abandoned soviet era eastern european cliches about it so everything was sort of very gun metal gray and depressing and run down even though it was also in the middle of some rather nice countryside right mm. so this massive event went on i mean the stadium was huge i mean i don't know how many thousands of people were there but it was monstrous but what was hilarious was that there was nothing outside the stadium right it was just this massive empty zone so you could stand 100 meters away in, in a tent where metallica were getting changed or whatever and all you could see was this massive sort of bowl of humanity over in the distance mm-hmm. um but, but without the millions of people between you and it if you see what i mean like you would normally see like a parking lot mm-hmm. anyway uh my friend alex Milas, who was the editor of metal hammer for which i wrote on a regular basis um couldn't make the show i mean it would have been his gig you know the editor would grab that gig with both hands normally uh, he was on deadline, couldn't do it. And he phoned me up and said, would I like to do it? Or he emailed me and said, would I like to do it? And I literally couldn't believe it. I was like, well, I knew the show was coming, but I don't think I was able to to take time to go to Poland and do it. You know, my kids were really small. And... So Hammer said, look, why don't we fly you there? And <laughs> you can write about it and get paid. Oh, and it was wow. this dream gig. I've been such a, uh, a, a sort of a fan for, of all those bands for so long, since my teenage years. And I've seen them all many times, obviously, but never in this sort of immense scenario. And uh, you can read more about it at my Facebook page, which which links to this article on Metal Hammer. But basically, when it went up online to celebrate 10 years of this event, uh, I was taken right back. And uh, what strikes me most, Brent, is that normally, you know, what these places are like backstage. They're swarming with kind of undesirable people. Yeah. You know, managers and, you know, personal assistants and girlfriends and Hang boyfriends. And, you know, yeah, just pond life. And... Um, when we showed up, there was only about 15 of us journalists, and there was no one there. There was about two security guards. Oh. Who were half there was a sort of empty catering place. There was a bar just with people waiting for you to come and <laughs> take the booze away. Wow. Um, and then these massive tents, these sort of giant white tents, one of which was Metallica's, and the other one which belonged to the other three bands. And, and 
security was so crap and no one knew what they were doing to such an extent that you could just go wherever you wanted. So I had been tasked with interviewing, you know, a few of these bands, uh, band members, which I did do. But I could just walk up to, for example, you know, I don't know, Kirk Hammett and say, hey, can I have a quick chat for half an hour? And he'd go, yeah, because nothing else was going on. Wow. So they were all there. It was, if you like thrash metal, it was this sort of comedy moment because you'd be sitting on this sofa somewhere. And Jeff Hanneman would be next to you. And then Dave Mustaine was talking to Lars Ulrich. And, and then Frank Bello was there talking to David Ellison. And all these thrash metal people were there and anthrax were there. And it was just, it was just nuts. Uh, so they started handing out this free vodka and, you know, the 15 of us who were there to review the show. Yeah. And, um, and just started doing our interviews and watched the show, which, which was mad. I was laughing. I was walking towards the stadium. It's about 100 meters walk. And this little golf cart trundled past me. And Kerry King was in there being taken to the stage with his, <laughs> with his like pointy guitar pointing out the side of the golf cart, you know, which was just kind of going along at three miles an hour or whatever. Yeah. And uh, it was just hilarious. And what was really funny, I won't go on about this all day, but what was really funny was that the bands were all slightly jockeying for position, not in a... Well, obviously Metallica was the big band, right? It's more yeah. that all the bands put together this really the heaviest possible set to try and compete with each other. Oh, although that for wasn't, sure. Although I knew that was what they were doing, you know. They were saying, yeah, man. Yeah, man, this set's heavy as fuck, man. And, and yeah, you know, all right, we get it, boys. You know, you're kind of... <laughs> it's a bit of a pissing contest here. Oh, but yeah. at the same time, at the same time, you know, all the, all the stuff that was spoken in the press about the good vibes and the friendship and the, the sort of sympathetic attitude between the bands was right. They, they, you know, it wasn't swarming with, with, you know, people who were getting in the way. It was just them and a couple of techs. Um, so I had a few drinks with Dave Mustaine. I uh, hung out with Frank Bellow, who I knew anyway. I uh, get be a, got friendly with David Ellison to the point where we did a book, actually, right after that. Yeah. Um, and it was just a great thing. It was a real milestone in my in my career i'm not really the, i'm not the kind of journalist that goes to gigs every night you know i'll only go to something special mm -hmm. uh just laziness really and uh but this was amazing i mean it was just amazing and i hope they won't do it again i don't think um because slayer have split up you know and mm -hmm. who knows well i don't know whether you know it was a financial success or whatever but it was amazing i was there the sort of the, the comedy opening version when they were trying to get everything right uh, which was which was why it was so amazing that that was really what was special about it to me sometimes when you get these gigs where no one really knows what they're doing, so yeah. you are given stupid levels of access. I've had that before. I was in Italy doing a Metallica thing, and um, the local security didn't really know what they were doing, and they gave me this ridiculous level of access that, that allowed me into their dressing room. And uh, <laughs> I, I, didn't, I didn't go in there because I wasn't that, that wasn't my business, you know, and I, I chose not to. Mm -hmm. You know, and then sometimes you have business to conduct at a show, and, and you haven't got any access, have you? You know, they get it wrong. So that happens too. Anyway, there we go. Yes, so that was that was incredible. What a great memory! Wow, the life of a music scribe, Joel. Usually, it's it's a massive pain in the neck because you can't get what you need, and there's an idiot in the way, and you can't get your interview, and yada yada yada, and everything gets cancelled. So this was the opposite of that. This was literally the perfect yeah. gig. That was a stroke of luck on your part just to to have that access. It was, it was yeah, it was kind. Of, Milas uh, said to me, "You owe me beers for life." <laughs> I said, "Yeah, I still, I still do." <laughs> that <laughs> uh, was a good oh that's great mm. uh, um i was going to ask you just very quickly how was uh i guess hetfield and, and mustaine were fine by that point oh yeah you know there's this picture um this famous picture of the four of them standing there doing a big metal thing mm -hmm. uh a big metal pose i was standing right next to hetfield but i didn't get into the picture it was kind of cropped out i think and it was real all that stuff that happened in the press i mean I, I, I wouldn't take any of it seriously. It's just sort of snarky bullshit comments that get magnified by people like me, frankly, in the press who write about them. Mm -hmm. um, they're just musicians doing business, aren't they, and just trying to make a living, and ultimately that transcends all that stuff. Um, and I don't think any of them are best mates forever, but at the same time, there's no reason why they can't work together and get stuff done. True. And I've come to learn that you know you don't have to be super close friends with the people in the same business as you. You, you don't have to be. You can be. But it doesn't matter if you're not. You can still get on perfectly well and get things achieved. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it was a genuinely nice. Uh, every, everyone was was quite charming. Good. That's good. That's good to hear. Uh, okay, so you've got a new book, Joel. Yes, I do. It, it is the official biography for a band called Scalmold. Is that right? Scalmold, right? Now that is. An Icelandic folk metal band or heavy metal band with sort of folk Viking influences. So I've done the official biography, right? Which means that I interviewed them all 
over a, um, uh, some time in Iceland that I spent and have turned that, that into their official story. And it's going to be called The Saga of Skarmold. And it's this beautiful, big, high quality book with amazing photos. And it's the oral history of the band. And the maddest thing about that book is that the, the foreword has been written by the president of Iceland. Right? Oh, wow. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's completely insane. In Iceland, you can just email the president's office <laughs> and say, and not even say, introduce yourself, because he knows who your band is, right? He comes to you. <laughs> wow. The president of Iceland will roll up. But there's no security or any kind of, you know, power play. He's not wearing a uniform. He's wearing his regular clothes with his wife and kids and shows up to your show. It's, it's, it's incredible. And then a the week later, he's in some gold carriage in Sweden representing, uh, Iceland. To the right. Swedish king. So anyway, so I, I literally phoned up this president and said, Oh, hi, Mr. President. Uh, what are your thoughts on folk metal then? And he had all this interesting stuff to say. Very, very clever man. Really knows his metal. And, uh, and, and he's a historian. So he could tie in what Skarmold's USP is lyrically, which is that this is the, this is the interesting part about this band. Whether or not you like metal or folk metal or Viking metal or anything like that, what they do is they bring this incredible historically literate approach to their music so in the ancient icelandic sagas there was a particular uh, way to write the lyrics or mm. whatever they were called would have been called the texts or i don't know not the lyrics but involving certain words in a sentence in a given sentence being stressed uh, or unstressed and accented and certain uh, amounts of i think alliteration and assonance it was almost shakespearean in the, in the kind of the rhyme schemes that it had to follow okay now this band do that in their heavy metal songs right oh. so they, they bring this incredibly literate, I'm sorry, literary approach to to their Viking metal, which itself is kind of beefed up Iron Maiden, you know, kind of cool, heavy, um, shrieky, metal-y stuff. And, and they sing about dragons and monsters, right? And they're mad in Iceland. And they're kind of a, a moderately sized band in Europe. You know, people know who they are. They play festivals and they come over every year, whatever. But in Iceland, they are really big. In Iceland, there's basically, uh, there's a band called Solstaf, Solstafur. I don't know how to pronounce it. Um, who are a bit bigger abroad. And then you've got a couple of punk bands and you've got dance music stuff and you've got Björk, obviously, and, and then a few other kind of cool Icelandic acts like Sigur or Rus. Mm -hmm. um, but this, so anyway, I was over there. Why was I there? Oh, we were on holiday. That was it. And while I was there, I interviewed the bass player for the magazine that I edit. And uh, we got on really well and had a night out with some beers and ate that, that really stinky fermented fish <laughs> and um, <laughs> nearly died. And uh, I said, let's do a book. Come on, we've got to do a book. This is so, so mad what you do. And they'd come out of nowhere. And just to finish off on this, their significance of this band ties in, A, with the rise of Iceland as a kind of object of fascination for foreign tourists. Mm -hmm. The wave of tourism since 2000 that's going to Iceland is nuts. And then it also ties in with the absolutely terrible collapse of their banking system in 2008, mm. where, where unlike most countries, they just jailed all the bankers responsible, right? Which was amazing. Um, and then there was that volcano eruption in, I think, was it 2009, 2010, yeah. that shut down all the airspace? So Iceland was in a pretty bad way at that point. And what happened, and this is according to the president, right, is that Icelanders started looking for sort of homegrown values, right? Something Icelandic to celebrate in the wake of the banking crisis and the uh, sort of the uh, atmospheric problem they had with the volcano. And uh, so Skarmold came up just at that right time, celebrating Icelandic literary history in a very entertaining, visual, heavy metal way. So that's the new book. And I think it's going to be called The Saga of Skarmold. Uh, Skarmold means Age of Swords, by the way. Cool historical reference. And, uh, you know, as with all the best people, and I mean all the best bands, these are people with jobs and families, right? You know, they just, you know, they put the kids to bed and then they go and rock out. Oh. And they do their day jobs. It's a, that's my favorite kind of musician. They do, it, they do it. There is some money in it, but they do it primarily for the love of it. And, and the literary exercise, the intellectual exercise of it. And um, I, I encourage anybody listening to this to check out Skarmold, not just because I've written the book, but because they really do bring this sort of intellectual, but fun approach to metal. To finish off, in Reykjavik, there is a the uh, con concert hall or opera house, I think it's called. It's called the Harper. It's this incredible bit of architecture, this massive, great place. And they played it, sold out a bunch of nights there, accompanied by the Icelandic Symphony Orchestra. Uh -huh. um, not in that kind of cheesy S and M way that Metallica did, in a much more integrated, um, uh, dramatic sort of theatrical way, and it's incredible. You know, it sold out in ten minutes or something. All these shows. So, what I'm saying is, it's it's a uniquely Icelandic phenomenon that you really have to go to Iceland to experience. But also, it, it's it's just a wonderful intellectual exercise as well, which a lot of metal is not. It doesn't have to be, but it's it's nice to see this kind of 
cerebral approach come into the stuff as well. So that's what I've been writing about. No, that that's a that's the the great point of difference that hooked me there. I I, I want to check this out because that's very interesting. So the tr- the song I've chosen is one called Scotta, which is uh, I was in the studio when they were recording it, coincidentally, and it's um. I said to this, uh, uh, Bibi, the bass player, who writes the stuff. I said, what, what is this? What's this song about? He said, well, the Scotter, uh, some kind of female goes to, um, a, uh, a, a man's house and kills his family. And, uh, <laughs> it's, it's the grimmest, darkest thought ever. But it's amazing at the same time. It's, it's extremely Lord of the Ringsy in a cool way and very Viking-y as well. So there you go. That's the song. The first song here is Skelmold Scotter. Yeah, Scotter. I was in the studio when they were shrieking Scotter into the microphone. That's great. Mm. So I'd never heard of the band before. Well, they're not massive outside Iceland. That's the interesting thing. Ah. You know? And then in Iceland, they are so big that they'll sell out this massive concert hall and the president will do the foreword to, his book, to their book, which cracked me up. I think that's so great. So that's, I, I, that's what I love about doing this show is you learn stuff like this. It's fantastic. Well, this is what travel does for you. You know, Lemmy said travel broadens the mind, didn't he? And he was totally right. You know, I never would have, I probably would never have heard of them if I hadn't gone over there and seen them for myself. But yeah. um, and I probably never would have spoken to a head of state. And actually, the challenge, when this book comes out, I'm going to place this challenge and say, can anybody think of a book where the sitting head of state did the foreword in anywhere? You know, hmm. whether, whether it's American president, whether, whether it's, I don't know, Winston Churchill. Um, I'm sure there would be ex-heads of state who were asked to do the foreword of the book. Mm-hmm. But is there is there an actual sitting in power head of state who's done that? And uh, if so, was it a book about heavy metal? I think not. So no. I think this is a, um, what's the word? A one, a, well, one-off a first. Oh, absolutely it is. All right, your next song, Joel, is by the Beatles, and it's Across the Universe. I'm familiar with this one. I've become a proper hippie, you know, in recent years. Brent, st- I started doing yoga a year and a half ago. Been is that a bit right? Of yeah, it's, a, it's been a bit of a life changer for me to the point where my wife has banned me from talking about it uh, with friends because I get quite boring about it. <laughs> you know, and, and looking, at, <laughs> looking at the state of the world and looking at, you know, what happens to us afterwards. And all that good stuff. And uh, the Beatles, uh, John Lennon specifically, you know, went into that zone, didn't they, intellectually? And Across the Universe, I've always loved. And it's crucial to note that the version of Across the Universe that I listen to is the one from Let It Be Naked. Mm. Uh, So as I'm sure you know, is the version of Let It Be that Paul McCartney um, caused to have released. That's right. uh, Around around about 2003, I think, maybe 2004. Yeah. Um, Maybe earlier, uh, which had all of, uh, the production crap taken off the original record. So in the original album, it was either Phil Spector or Alan Klein, the Beatles manager at the time, who uh, insisted on having loads of strings, uh, there's a choir, you've got Yoko singing. Um, all this extraneous terribleness yep. um, was drizzled all over this lovely acoustic song, which is just an acoustic guitar and John Lennon and I think a little bit of um, percussion maybe and a sitar maybe. And it's just lovely. And uh, it's been my favourite Beatles song for years. But it definitely taps into the uh, sort of hippie side of me. So that's why I'm choosing that one. Mm, good. Yeah, getting back to that point, that was the straw that uh, broke McCartney's back, I do believe, in leaving the Beatles. <laughs> I'm not surprised. I, I've just read his autobiography that he did like a long time ago, 20 years ago. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, he talks about Yoko in the studio. I mean, to be honest with you, man, if me and you and two other people were in a band and one of them insisted on bringing in his girlfriend to every single recording session who gave feedback of her thoughts about the song to everyone else uninvited. That might annoy me too. <laughs> that would drive me nuts. So I don't know if you've ever heard that clip. She's in the studio and she would walk up to microphones if she was across the room from John Lennon and yell, John, John, to get his attention because it would be over the PA. And so it, it, it was it was madness in the studio. He's probably being kind. I mean, I appreciate the kind of, you know, pure love and the artistic vision that they shared. And they were young and stupid, you know, which we all have been... At the same time, that would have been deeply, deeply annoying. And um, yeah, there you go. But so fortunately, there's this um, unmessed with version of the song, which I really enjoy listening mm-hmm. to. Yeah, actually, it's funny. Uh, when when this podcast goes live, I either will or will have not interviewed Paul McCartney between now and then because um, I have an interview request in with him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So again, this is going to be past history by the time people hear this. The magazine that I edit, Bass Guitar, is about to change its name to Bass Player. Um, because it, it's been identical to bass player anyway for the last couple of years. So what we're doing is we're changing the British, smaller British brand to, to match the bigger American brand. Mm-hmm. Um, and to celebrate that, which ties in with bass player's 400th issue, I've planned a Paul McCartney cover. 
So his people have been in touch and said, yeah, yeah, no, we're, we're quite keen. We're just finalising it. We're just hoping to put it together and you know, let you know. And we'll be in touch. And they've been very good, actually, but who knows if it's going to happen between now and then. So probably record two things, uh, I should say. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, it never worked out, you know. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> And at the same time, oh my god, it was amazing. I mean, he, uh, my life stream. Oh my god, it's a case of shredding as McCartney, isn't it? It, it, it kind of uh, happened, happened, and it didn't happen at the same time because we right. don't know yet. So there you go. I have a feeling it will happen. I think you, you'll have to let me know as soon as it does because um, that is. I will. That's that's the ultimate. I mean, it really is. I, I've said many times that I believe that Paul McCartney is the most prolific songwriter in the history of recorded music. I, I really feel that way. I think certainly when it comes to quality, you know mm -hmm. I mean, there are probably session people who've written more songs and recorded more songs. But when it when it comes to epoch shaping music, yeah, you know, even even if you could argue that the stuff hasn't really been uh, as great as a solo artist as it has been as it was when he was in the Beatles. Even so, though, my God, I mean, there's a reason why he sells out arenas to this day, and it's not just nostalgia. It, whether I will have or will have not met him, <laughs> I'm uh, I, I'm a big fan. Yeah, no, me too. And I do hope that happens. So let me know if it does. Yeah. Definitely, I will. Uh, next tune is Hannah by Kaimia. Oh, yeah. yeah, I'd never heard of this person, Hannah, the singer. Uh, but uh, I put the next couple of songs in as a little tribute to my kids because they have been really uh, influential lately on my taste in music. Alice, my daughter, who's now 16, 17 probably by the time this comes out, she um, she's always introduced me to cool music and she knows that I like when I'm not listening to metal and, and all the other good stuff, I do like sort of trippy, poppy, dancey kind of songs. And this is this is one of those. It's called Chimera mm -hmm. by this uh, singer, Hannah. And uh, it's amazing. It's really um, ethereal and floaty in space and all that kind of good stuff that we like. Uh, the vocal melody is insane. And uh, it has all these cool squelchy sounds that, you know, that people <laughs> that you like. And um, it's just a nice song. And, and the reason I put it in here really is just to illustrate that I'm now getting a lot of my modern music from my kids. Yeah. Um, which is which great because I don't know about you, but I kind of tuned out of every new thing, you know, in my twenties probably, and and just I, I could talk learnedly, I guess, about metal stuff now, new 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 releases by the major metal bands, but even the kind of underground new cool metal bands I couldn't tell you about because I'm not in in those clubs every night, I'm not reading those magazines all the time. Mm -hmm. So it's nice to have the youth. Uh, feeding, feeding some information upwards at me, and uh, people are probably going to hear this now and say, "What? Well, this song's really mainstream." It was like number one for six months or something, and I'm going to go, "Oh, really?" <laughs> but at the same time, I'd never heard of it, <laughs> and uh, it was, it, it's just a really nice little tune. Awesome! Wow, we're going to swing back again. Uh, Slipknot, Eyeless is your next pick. So this is for my son Tom now, uh, who is 13. And what's funny is that. I wrote a book about Slipknot when, when they came out or just after they came out. So in, in 2001, 2002, I listened to them a lot. I thought they were amazing. I, I thought they were one of the very few bands from that terrible new metal wave um, who could really hold their own uh, against the thrashers who I loved, right? Mm -hmm. Not not because the stuff was particularly fast or brutal or all the kind of metrics that we use to measure these bands by when we're being macho. But, but the intensity of it is insane. And this song that my son really likes is called Eyeless, and it's from their first album, which came out in 99, I think. Mm -hmm. Which is generations ago, right? In metal, in metal terms, isn't oh, it? Yeah. You know, it's like, well, 21 years ago in real time, and five generate or five swings of the wheel of fashion, kind of thing, um, in metal. But it is a hell of an intense song. I hadn't really listened to it for ages, and then Tom was really getting into Slipknot. I played him a few songs and sort of left him to it. And we went to see them. That was it. Yeah, we went to see them here in London in January, just mm -hmm. before, or not long before lockdown, I guess. And it was an insane show, and uh, the PR here. Michelle Kerr, who's, a, who's a, a sweetheart, managed to get us tickets in um, a sort of a, what do they call it? It's like a private box. Like a box, yeah. It has its own bar, super comfy seats and, and you know, all these elite, uh, these elite trappings. You know, I don't know, companies pay thousands for these things to, 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 to entertain their corporate clients. Um, and we managed to get a couple of seats. So we were in there. Uh, the only other people in there was um, uh, Austin Dickinson, who's the son of Bruce Dickinson of Iron Maiden, and his girlfriend. So the four of us were in there just enjoying the show. Oh, and wow. it was amazing. It was incredible. Slip, Slipknot put on this massively theatrical show, of course. They always have. But now now they're a bit old and uh, <laughs> they've been doing it a while. I think they, they've amped up the visuals a bit, you know, to kind of take the pressure off them. And it, 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 yeah, anyway, this is just a really cool song. And it's because it's from the first record, it's insanely intense. I mean, like, it's, it's razor sharp and turns on a sixpence and it's, it's mad. 
Um, a bit later in their careers, they stretched out a bit and expanded and incorporated some uh, more relaxed atmospheres. But this this song's crazy. Anyway, so that that gets blasted out in our house on a regular basis. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I remember when this came out in 1999, and um, the intensity of this, I think, got a lot of people's attention because it, it just it was almost like. Um, <sighs> You know, over the, the over the course of history, those bands that come along every twenty years or ten years, whatever it is, and you go, "Whoa!" Like this is a game changer. Slipknot was definitely a game changer in terms of intensity. It, it was, and it was hard to get past the visuals at first. And if you were uh, an, an extreme metal snob like I was, then you just thought, "Oh, what is this?" And then when you heard it, and you realized that what that was was a bunch of uh, thrash and death metal musicians sort of shoehorned into this new style mm-hmm. and they brought all that intensity to a kind of a mid-tempo band, then you understood why it was just bursting with sort of uh, insane energy. Um, oh, yeah. And they, they stayed the course, which was amazing to me because so many of their terrible compatriots in that scene faded away, thank God. But no, so that, that's, been, that's been nice to see, I have to say. I've met most of those dudes. They're, they're nice blokes. You know, they have a slightly dark worldview. Um, as you can tell from the songs, you know, but at the same time, um, you know, they're perfectly affable chaps, most of them. There's an interesting line in this song that always kind of stuck with me. The, the line is, you can't see California without Marlon Brando's eyes. Yeah, what happened was uh, they were in the street somewhere and uh, a person of um, intermittent sanity was just shouting that oh. on the street. Oh. You can't see California without Marlon Brando's eyes. And... Um, it means nothing, and it still means nothing, and they just turned it into a song. How about that? <laughs> ah. But, uh, it, yes, it, yeah, so that's what that was, you know, from some, some random person who was just shouting his head off in the middle of the street. Oh, wow. I always wondered where that came from. Who has done that after a few beers, Brent? <laughs> well, we've all done it. <laughs> Haven't we? <laughs> you can't see Toronto without Devin Townsend's eyes, or uh, here's another famous, um, Neil Young's eyes. Another there you famous go. Canadian. That's it. There That's you it. it. <laughs> you can't see Toronto without Neil Young's eyes. I like it. You heard it here first. <laughs> you heard it here first. That's right. Morbid Angel is your last tune. Maze of Torment. This is what, 88, 89? Um, yeah, I can't remember. 89 probably. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the most recent book I did uh, before the Scalmord one, which we've talked about, was the autobiography of David Vincent, who was the singer in Morbid Angel um, twice. From, I want to say, 88 to 95, and then 2004 to 2014, I think. Right? So he did two 10-year stints in that band. Uh, he left in, 20, I think, 2014. And he and I had had a dialogue before that about doing his autobiography, me being his co-writer. And when he did finally leave that band, uh, he called me up and said, let's, let's get on with it. Let's do it. Uh, so I went over to Texas uh, for a week out near um, Austin, where they live. Nice. It was just hilarious. I mean, we, we just we just sat and talked all day. As you do, as you, as you do in this situation, you fill the fridge up with beers and just go. Mm-hmm. And on one of the days, we decided to go on a road trip. And I hadn't been to Texas before, so um, I wanted to go out and see the sort of uh, the prairie or what do you call it? The desert, you know, the kind of <laughs> out of town sort of thing. So uh, we jumped into David's um, vehicle and off we went. And it was amazing. I, it was a real eye opener for me. I'd been to New York and California but I, and Canada, actually, but I hadn't been to Texas. Um, and I was quite seduced by that whole Texan thing. Um, at the time, Trump was running for president. Mm. And there were these massive vote Trump signs everywhere. And when I was laughing my head off, I assumed this was just a joke and he would never get in, uh, which shows shows what I know, right? I was the same. I was the same. So, yeah, so for a week, we just drank tequila and talked about death metal but but more more than that i should stress is that he's um uh, an educated intelligent man he's quite an intellect so most of the book which came out in january this year which is why i'm talking about it is a really deep psychological exploration of what it's like to be in these bands and what to and what writing this music is all about mm-hmm. if, if you're familiar with morbid angel you know that their first few albums were uh, all about occult stuff in an intelligent way and this song maze of torment is a is a song about suicide it's a metaphor about suicide which i didn't know anyway so that book came out in january uh, and it's called i am morbid which is the name of a band that david now runs uh, after morbid angel and he also has a country music career he does loads of stuff it's, it has a re- oh of course he's in a band called ultimas which is insanely precise and technical and groovy death metal band so mm. that was a nice little step into that world you know, uh, very interesting to see one of the prime practitioners doing it. That, that band was huge back in the day. 
you know, in 93, 94, 95, they, they were, they were playing these vast venues and, uh, they had this, um, I think it was the biggest selling death metal record of all Covenant, um, which, which was signed to a, that came out on a major label. So it was, it was interesting to see his trajectory, you know, through life. Uh, he quit that band in order to undergo some sort of self administered, uh, psychotherapy, which is interesting to read about. Emerged from that a sort of stronger, nicer, more empathetic man. Um, and then embarked on the rest of his career. And it's, it's just a fun read and an interesting one that challenges people's thinking. And, uh, that's why I wanted to mention it. Wow. Very interesting. Well, it was. It was fun. A lot of fun to do. Speaking with you challenges my thinking, Joel. You, you always have so many interesting things to say. And I learn a lot from you all the time. Seriously, I do. You know, it's, it's a burden that I carry, friend. I'm just... <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. That's very kind. That's very kind. I think people will enjoy these books. There's a, there's a lot of interesting stuff in there. Oh, certainly. Well, Joel, thank you very much, my friend. I appreciate you taking the time. Oh, and I love talking to you. I wish we could... Uh, reenact your amazing book and uh, go and go and do the full mushrooms in the mountains for three days listening to music i would love that one day you know what we should uh we should hold each other to that and we should actually do that because i i can think of no better partner i think that you and i it, it would it would be fantastic it would just be the best it would be so funny yeah i can think of all the people you, yeah, you had chris charlesworth on this podcast didn't you yeah, yeah you know god he could tell us his stories about drinking with john lennon one day, my friend, it's got to be on the bucket list. We will do it. Definitely, definitely. When when all this uh, nonsense is over, either I'll get over there or you come over here and, and we'll get it done. Brilliant. All right. All right, man. Thank you much, Brent. Thank you. I appreciate it, Joel. Take good care, okay? Take yourself, mate. We'll speak soon. All right. Bye-bye. See ya. Bye-bye. All right. This has been No Sleep Till Sudbury with Brent Jensen and my very special guest, Mr. Joel McIver. Till next time, take good care. Brent Jensen is the best-selling author of No Sleep Till Sudbury, Leftover People, and All My Favorite People Are Broken. All titles available in stores and on Amazon Worldwide.